favoritism really hurts. Not everybody knows what this is like, but there are people that feel really hurt because they're left out because they're not part of the cool group. They're not part of the group that knows how to do this or knows how to do that. And they're kind of marginalized or maybe they're just part of the, shall we say, have nots. And the haves don't want to associate with them. And this kind of favoritism is detrimental. It's hard on people. And it's something that's just as inconsistent with what it means to be part of the body of Christ, where we have been knit together as one with everybody that is a believer in Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Tim Holsher, and we're looking at what God has provided us to get along, to function together as members of the body of Christ. And we're surveying through the New Testament, and we've come to James chapter 2, and we looked at these verses at the beginning yesterday, but I want to continue with these and move on down through the the context to follow. He says, my brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring, dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention or look at the one who's wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren, did God not choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Is not the rich, is, or is it not the rich who oppress you, personally drag you into courts? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? We're going to stop there. If, I'm just going to remind you generally of the idea that James is writing to, he calls to these Jewish believers who are scattered. They're scattered, I don't believe, from the Old Testament scattering that happened uh, back in, uh, in, in the 700s uh, and then again with Babylon, but it'd be the big scattering back in the 700s BC. This scattering, I believe, is a more recent one that took place in uh, uh, Acts chapter 8 following the death of Stephen and the persecution that ensued under Paul, kind of leading the way. And as they were scattered, and I always just try to have to paint this picture for us, because you and I don't think about that. What was it if you had to leave your home, you would put your house up for sale, you'd try to get the best price you could for your house, you'd hire a U-Haul, you'd pack up your belongings, you'd haul them off, and you'd travel to another place and set up house. But at that time, some of these people were run off and they had to leave behind their farms. They had to leave behind them because no one was going to pay them anything. They know that due to the persecution, you're going to be run off and we're going to get this farm pennies on the dollar or just whoever comes in and claims it because no one's going to pay you for it because you're getting run off and you don't take your possessions with you because there's no such thing as a U-Haul. So there's hardly anything you can haul with you unless you already are a person that has a lot of shall we say, material wealth in terms of coins where you could actually hire someone to transfer your stuff, but most of these people didn't have this. So this is the this is the situation we have these people in. And some of these people then foolishly, thinking the way the world does, are playing favorites with the rich over the poor, thinking in some way that becoming nice to this rich person, it'll benefit them in some way. Okay? So he's putting this in perspective and he says, why do you, why do you ch chase to curry the favor of the rich? Because they're the ones that actually drag you into court. You guys don't have the money to defend yourselves. You can't afford lawyers to defend yourself. So you get drug into court and they squeeze you for even the pennies that you have left. And they say, what it says, blaspheme the fair name by which you've been called. That fair name, meaning the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So these are Jesus followers. And again, this is what it's indicating. This is actually helping us understand what's happening to these people, that there are Jews over there in Judea that are dragging believing Jews into court and they're taking, they're seizing their property. The book of Hebrews tells us this over in Hebrews 10. You had your, you, number of you had your property seized. And so these people are blaspheming. These are followers of that Jesus, that liar that misled people. So they're saying these things about the Lord Jesus. And in saying that, 
they're using this, making a case against them to take their property. That's what I was saying. To take their houses, to take their lands, to take confiscate wealth. You and I do not appreciate just how severe this was for these believers who have now been scattered out and had to go off to other places. So we come to James chapter 2 and verse 8. If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law, according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, one of the things that's important when James is writing, if you go to Acts 15 and you look at the discussion between the church in Jerusalem and, the, and, the, and Paul and Barnabas, you can see that Paul and Barnabas have not been teaching Christians to live by law. Out there among the Gentiles, the new Gentile converts are being taught to be essentially to live by grace. And Peter summarizes that as much uh, in his little thing where he gets done listening to Paul and he says, hey, we too, we too are going to get in on this. We Jews, Peter's recognizing. And the whole issue was the question in Acts 15 are how are these how are people, these new converts, these Gentiles, how are they supposed to live? Are we going to make them get circumcised and keep the Mosaic law? Not in order to get saved in the past, but to be saved as part of his present tense salvation. That's the whole issue here in James. We're going to have them do that, or are we going to allow this, what Paul's teaching, where he's teaching them to live by who they are in Christ and to live by grace? James, as late as Acts 21 James says, hey, remember, Paul, the decision we arrived at, that was okay for the Gentiles, but the Jews are still supposed to be keeping the law. That's why when you read James, James is holding the law up here as a standard for these believing Jews. It calls these the 12 tribes of Israel that are scattered. He's holding this up as the standard. Why? Because the law still was their standard. In Acts 21, it is still their standard. Go read it. James tells us that. But it was not a standard for how they got saved, how they became righteous with God, how they had a standing before God, how they received forgiveness of sins. That, for the Jewish believers, as for the Gentile believers, was by faith in Jesus Christ. That's settled. That's done. The issue in Acts 15 and the issue that comes up again in Acts 21 is, how are these people supposed to live? And they use the word save because for them, save could be past, could be present, could be future, depending on context. We have a bad problem that we only think of the past. And therefore, a lot of people do not understand James and they don't understand a number of passages. So when he's talking about the law, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That was, as he says, this was the, the, the royal law or the kingdom law was that you need to really be taking, looking out for other believers. This isn't Christ's commandment in John chapter 13. This is a statement of the law. He says, if you do that, if you really are looking out for a brother, you're doing well. But if you show partiality, that same word that he used back up in the first part of chapter 2, where he says, don't have your faith concerning Christ with partiality, he says, you are, you're working out sin. And you're convicted by, notice the law, as a transgressor. Transgression always has to involve law. Forever keeps the whole law, and yet stumbles in one point, he's become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, don't commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you commit murder, you're still a transgressor. In other words, you can't pick what commands in the law are going to keep you from being a transgressor and which ones don't. You break any of them in your transgressor law. Yeah, it, he's not saying here that if you committed murder, you're guilty of adultery. He said, you're, but you're guilty of breaking law, even if it's just one part of that law. And I believe the reason he uses murder here is because, well, <laughs> there's some hints that some of these people are almost come to this uh, in the way that they're scrambling. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, again, this is with reference to people that were living under the law. And under the law, the law was merciless. It, the, God told them into the law. If, if your brother sins, you, you do not let your eye show him any mercy or any pity. If he's guilty of breaking the law, he is to be punished under the law. And this is what James is citing as a standard. Because remember, most of these believing Jews were still living this way. Verse 14. 
And the other thing to keep in mind is James is most likely the earliest of the New Testament letters. So this is written before what Paul explains to us about living by grace has really spread throughout even the Christian church. Verse 14 of chapter 2. What use is it then, my brother, and if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Now, people pit this against Paul, but this isn't. This is talking about, can that faith save him? That's talking about growth. This isn't talking about save him from hell, make him righteous, get him forgiven. This is talking about believers. If they have faith, but they never exercise faith, they never do anything from faith, are you really growing? Faith isn't something static that just sits there. Faith is something intended for everyday life. So if a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, you tell them to go over there and sit against the wall on the floor at my footstool. No, you need to be taking care of them. And one of you says, go in peace, be warmed and be filled. That doesn't do any good. America would be, rather than struggling, all of us struggling with being overweight, we'd all be thin people that we want to be because all we'd have to say is, oh, I'm full. Just tell myself I'm full and I'm full. But <laughs> We all know that that doesn't work any more than when you wake up and you're cold and you say, just don't think about cold, think warm thoughts. It doesn't make you warm. And he said, you do not give to them what is necessary for the body. What use is that? Even so faith, if it does not have works, is dead. Being, not just by itself, but kata here, being measured by itself. In other words, you can't measure faith by itself. You can only measure faith by what you see it do. But here's the point. We get so caught up in this issue about faith and works and and we everybody loses their mind over this that in the process we miss the main point that what James is trying to say is you've got brothers and sisters that have real legitimate needs and you're going to say you have faith then exercise that faith, not faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, he's saying, just believing faith in God's promises for you as a believing person, direct faith faith at the fact that God can give you the ability to help these people. Not that he's going to rain down cash on you to help them, but that out of what you do have, even if it's a little, you can help. This is his point. His point is that favoritism is, is detrimental to this unity in the body of Christ. And if these people are indeed your brothers and sisters and they really do have legitimate needs then you need, to, you need to meet those needs. You need to be involved in helping them with those needs. And yeah, there's things in here theologically that people need to understand about faith and all of that that's going on. And I briefly hit it, but I just sometimes, I'm afraid we get so wrapped up in that, we miss the point that he's still really dealing with the issue of favoritism. Christians showing favoritism to those who are wealthy. I mean well, to the detriment or the exclusion of those who are poor. And that's not the way the body of Christ should operate. We've already seen the verses that we ought to have the same care for one another, that we as believers ought to be able to look at one and if they rejoice, we rejoice with them. If they weep, we weep with them. But to stand aloof of those people and to to push them off to the side, and we're talking about believers in Christ, pushing them off the side is inconsistent with the kind of faith that we should be exercising as Christians, as people who already are Christians, the kind of faith that we should be exercising with regard to our Lord Jesus Christ right now on a day-to-day -day basis. Don't show favoritism. See all of them the way God sees them. James doesn't break that out in here the way Paul does. But that's going to be a background that's going to help us understand this context better. Hope this is encouraging you to think about how you live your life, the people that you direct attention to, and help you think, hey, maybe it challenges you like it challenges me about not showing favoritism, which is something that we need to be reminded of, just as James readers did. I trust you have a good day in the Lord then, and I thank you for joining me.